Well, a happy noon to everybody. Thanks for coming to the Aquinas Lecture Series. Our presenter today is Dr. Deb Wickering, and she's going to be talking to us about Bedouin research, voices and images. Please help me welcome Deb Wickering. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming and showing up and turning out. Um, I'm still in a little bit of culture shock after my sabbatical. I'm really happy to see my colleagues and really happy to be with my students, but the pace of life around here is, um, it keeps threatening to overwhelm me. So I'm in culture shock, but in ethnography we learn, that's one of the tools that we learn from is culture shock. So we'll just, um, we'll, I'll just accept it and go with it. I'd like to first um, thank very much some um, folks who helped me out on my sabbatical. First to the provost and to the faculty development committee for um, granting me the opportunity to, um, to have a sabbatical. Then to my colleagues in the sociology department who um, shouldered the burden of, of my work uh, during the time I was gone. And in particular, I'd like to thank the library and especially Chad Bukowski and his students for helping me. He did the real work of transforming the um, material that I have into uh, digital images and MP3 um, sound files. And so I'd like to thank them very much for, for their help. So um, half a lifetime ago, uh, like a quarter of a century ago, more than a lifetime for many of the students in this room, as a fledgling ethnographer, I stayed with a community of Bedouins, most of you know this, who some 12 years before I arrived had decided to leave their nomadic life um, in the, on the Red Sea coast of the Sinai Peninsula and settle down and do the tourist trade. So these are the data and the artifacts that tell a story about what I learned from the people that I stayed with. I learned how to talk. I learned how to give and how to receive and I learned how to move from stranger to intimate in a setting where pastoral nomads were settling down for, were settling actually for a cash global economy. You're welcome to come up and take a look at these raw artifacts and these, um, these notes. And um, what I have here is, oop, oop, oop. These, are, these are my field notes from two years and three months a field study, and so you can take a look and see what kinds of notes this ethnographer makes. These are dolls that I made of, um, of uh, Bedouin women and how they dressed at that time. This motley crew here are my field tapes, all cassette tapes from um, field research. So that's, um, that's that. Some of the smell, smells a bit musty. August is a good time to be in the basement. Um, and these are slides and negatives from the um, photos that I did. And then there are other artifacts. There's a dress that I wore. There's some um, Bedouin veils. There's some, uh, some beadwork that they've made for sale and, um, and some caps and, and bags. So have, a, have a, a look around at them if you want to and, and, and feel the material artifacts. Now it's time to... Um, now it's time to bundle all of this up and uh, I guess save it for posterity. Um, I organized, reproduced the data, I took the information from the tapes and, um, and put them into order so that I went through and listened to them and, and I have um, in, uh, in, in order of how they go and who's speaking and what they're talking about, translated some of it. Um, from the information on the cassette tapes and then onto MP3, I, um, I put the digital images chronological, so I'm organizing the material. But you know, I'm a professional ethnographer, but a real neophyte archivist. And so I found that at the end of it all, that I had only just touched the top of the mountain when it comes to the kind of work that's needed to be done in order to make this available and useful for people. I want to provide a digital archive of the material that, was, um, that I have for the Aquinas Library, for the American University in Cairo Library, and also for the Bedouin community. Um, 
I want to provide it because I want to provide the raw material for the use of future scholars who may find it um, useful and also for people in the community who participated in the study. And already the Bedouins have been asking me, do you have any of those old cassette tapes? Do you have any of the stuff on those old cassette tapes? We'd really like to listen to those. And it's from 1987 and to 1991. So, um, uh, so it'll be interesting to them as well. So I want to provide that, and that's what I'm doing. Um, and that's what I did on my sabbatical. Uh, today I want to tell you more about the science of ethnography, its aims and its methods, and how I went about my study. And then a little bit later I have some images that because they were black and white uh, negatives and prints, I never was able to um, show them. So this will be the first time that all but one of them has been shown in public. Ooh, And, um, and I also have audio clips that may or may not come across of um, some singing and some, um, some useful material. But first I want to tell you a little bit about my discipline, anthropology. Anthropology is, as my students know, the study of humanity. And now cue the Star Trek theme. We study humanity across space and through time. So we go from the earliest ev evidence of the evolution of Homo sapiens from primate to human to contemporary people, so across um, or through time, and we study humans wherever they might be found, mostly, I mean, always on this globe, so on the earth, it goes across space. And to accomplish this mission, we have, there are four fields in anthropology, and we all work closely together, but we have quite different, um, quite different study fields. The four fields are archaeology, archaeologists are anthropologists who study the past, and interpret the physical evidence of the past, mostly found in the earth and under the ground. Physical anthropology, which can be as varied as medical anthropology, um, primatology, think Jane Goodall living with the chimps, uh, forensics, all, all our um, physical anthropologists, linguistics, who study maybe the most important aspect of culture, language, and cultural anthropology, and that's me. We work together because the archaeologist may be good at finding the material underground and preserving it, and then may need a physical anthropologist to study the bones and to study the artifacts um, physically, and then may need a cultural anthropologist to help to interpret the culture that is the context for the um, artifacts that they find. So the broad scope of the project of anthropology doesn't really fit neatly into any one um, scholarly genre. And so anthropology is a natural science at times, it's a social science at times, and it's also a humanity. So we kind of, we kind of spread over um, several genres. I want to talk to you today about my particular field, which is ethnography. So you divide that in half, and it's ethno, which means culture or ethnic, ethnicity, and graphy, um, to write. So we write culture. And ethnography is a research method and a very powerful tool to understand human life and human problems. And, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a simple kind of methodology in one way, but it has very um, powerful applications in... Um, uh, it, it uncovers through long-term both participation and observation a whole way of life and the meanings of their practices to the people who practice them. It is the one method, I think, in the sciences that um, comes closest to understanding meaning of life and the reality of a particular community of people from the perspective or the point of view of the people who practice it. So it's a, it's a very useful um, methodology in, in many, many ways. It can, um, it, can help with, um, it can help with policy, it can help with education programs, and it can help in any kind of endeavor that's seeking to understand um, the life of, of people from, from their own perspective. And so it has a lot of useful applications. Um, we, we study in using ethnography, ethnography in anthropology, we study the universal categories of human experience, 
like language, ritual, reciprocity. Um, everybody eats, sleeps, is born, dies, mates. Well, they mate before they die. But um, everybody, everybody does these things. So they're, they're universal human traits. And yet, it's, it's in its wonderful diversity of forms that we are um, able to appreciate it. So um, Clifford Geertz says, uh, one of the most significant facts about humanity may finally be that we all begin with the natural equipment to live a thousand kinds of lives, but end up having lived only one. So we have in our bodies the natural equipment to be humans, but the way, the way that these practices manifest themselves are so diverse that it's, it's, it's a, wonderful, um, a wonderful diversity, and anthropologists, ethnographers are interested in, um, in getting with one particular example of that humanity and, and studying that in depth. We make some assumptions when we, when we move into the field. One is that life, um, we want to describe life as a whole, and that, and that our, our, our life is holistic. We have a holistic study. So that means that no matter what I particularly study in a community, that that particular study is um, going to be, or that, that particular aspect, whether it's weaving, bead making, um, uh, the economy, uh, whatever it is, that that particular aspect relates to all of the other practices that happen in, um, in that community. And so we can understand the whole by diving into a particular. Also, we study everyday life. So we immerse ourselves in everyday life um, of the people that we study. And, um, and I have a quote from Dr. Brian Hoey who says, it is in the neglected details of everyday life that real insight into the meaning of social and cultural change is most powerfully expressed. So we find that those things that we most take for granted, the assumptions that we make, you know, we go through our lives every day, we don't have to think about, um, we don't have to think about much, and if we had to think about it, it would be a real problem. If we had to think about how to take one step after another, or that when I open the door, there's going to be a sidewalk out there, and then I turn right, we just make, take that for granted. And that is necessary in order to live in everyday life. But it's, but it's in the, those assumptions that we make about reality of everyday life that we ethnographers find the most profound meaning. So, um, so we study everyday life. And then in many ways, our study is also comparative. It's, um, it's comparative in our methods. So another quote from Geertz, we study a local example of the forms human life has locally taken. So we study the local. We study the particular. And then what we can do, and what we do do, to build theory um, of anthropology is we make comparisons between those locals. And we come up with more general, um, more general explanations of the diversity of ways that people do things. So we learn more about what it is to be human by comparing all of these local examples. But also, um, it, it's comparative in that uh, we can we compare one locality to another, and then we build, and then we build theories. But um, there's, in, in our particular method of ethnography, we, um, we do another kind of comparison, and that is that the, the ethnographer, him or herself, is uh, one of the central research tools. So that when, um, when we go into the field, unlike a deductive science, anthropology is inductive. We, use, we follow our noses, we use insights, and we follow, we follow trains of evidence in order to come up with what we come up with, in order to build, th we build our theories on the ground. So before we go in, we don't have a hypothesis. We don't predict or we don't, um, we don't, add, we don't um, have a question that, that, that says, here's what I think will happen and then test it. Rather, we go in and we, we follow the evidence where it lays. We follow the trail. It's more like, an, um, it's more like a detective kind of um, operation 
than it is like a lab operation or, um, or a uh, scientific um, experiment. We are, we're like strangers in a strange land without a map. And that's how we start. Now, of course, it would be ridiculous to say that um, when I went to stay with the Bedouins that I was able to make myself tabula rasa and erase everything that I know to go into the field in order to um, take on that life. But what happens, and this is another, another of the, the interesting comparative aspects of ethnography, is that what happens is that when I'm immersed in their life, I bring with me all of my own cultural assumptions, all of the things that I expect without thinking about, um, the, the taken for granted assumptions of my own life. I know I'm in a strange place, but I'm going to act in ways that have always worked for me. And it's in acting in those ways that all of a sudden I find out, oh, this isn't working anymore. I can't, I can't go from A to B here, even in areas of politeness or areas of, um, of um, very simple things, eating, all of that, we have to learn a new way. And in learning that new way, our own assumptions are brought right up into our face. So, and I'm going to have a story about this, an example to, to show you. So we use ourselves as comparative tools as well. Because when it doesn't work, then what we have to do is say, well, how does it work here? And what that shed light, sheds light on is it sheds light both on the practices of the people that we're with, but it also sheds light on our own, my own culture. So it's quite a transformative experience as well. And by the time people are done doing their field work, they have um, become quite accustomed to living in an alien way. So we say that anthropology makes the alien familiar and the familiar alien. So I would like to, um, I would like to turn now to um, an example of what I mean so you can get a little bit better understanding. And here I can just do away with my notes and turn to the uh, slide projector. This way. These are some pictures from the, um, these are some images from the very earliest field work that I did in 1987, three months um, from the American University in Cairo toward my master's degree. And so these are very early. And I had decided when I went in that because I only had three months, which isn't really a long enough time to completely um, immerse myself in another culture, that what I would do is I would use the, um, the, the uh, willingness of one of my, um, my field subjects, her name is the Ina, and, um, and get her life story. And I thought if I started with one particular life story, I might get clues then about women's lives in um, the Tarabine community, and I might be able to then go more broadly out and um, test out some of the, um, the theories I'm starting to make about what women's lives are like and with, with other women in the community and come up with a broader explanation of what their lives are like. So, um, so I, I, I went and I stayed with this family. This is the Ina. And we spent our time um, doing everyday life in, um, in the Ina's community. Now, I wanted this life story, right? I wanted it. I had my Sony Walkman, and I was going out there to get this life story. And once I had her life story on tape, then I'd have my data, and I knew that I could then go back. I could, I could work with the data. I could interpret the data, and I would get my master's degree. So I was intent on getting this life story. And she agreed, yes, let's, um, let's do the life story. But what I found is that, um, oh, and, th and this is the, um, let's see if the, the, the tape is going to, um, the clip that I've got is going to play. This is the Ina, and the very, first, um, the very first time we taped, she loved my tape player. She picked it up, learned how to work it, and then she said, here, you'll hear her say, what do you want? You want a song? You want a poem? What do you want? And I said, you can't hear it on here, but I said, I want a, I want a story of your life, all in Arabic, of course. And um, she said, okay, I'll give you a song that the girls sing when they go up herding. So I should have gotten... Let's see if we can hear it.
There she's saying, at the end she was saying, ma salama, ma salama, goodbye, goodbye. And then she says, bye bye, bye bye, good morning. <laughs> so that was the very, and I, I should have gotten a clue because when I asked for a story of her life, which is what I wanted, she said, okay, I'll give you a song that the girls play when they, when they go out herding. So she was giving me something different. And, and right then, but I had different assumptions, right? I was going to get stories that she would tell me about her life. And that's not what she was giving me. So I followed her around, and, um, you know, and, and I had my little tape player, and I kept waiting for times, and she kept saying, yes, I want to I wanna talk with you, yes, let's do stories. And every once in a while, we'd sit down, and we'd have an hour, and she'd give me a story, and I'd feel, yes, and so then I'd get even more eager, and I'd follow her around while she was wiping the baby's butt and cleaning um, dirty pots and pans and helping her mother-in-law out and uh, chopping up a frozen chicken to make for lunch, and, and we just never had time. And she said, you know, I need time, I need time, we're just you and I, and, and, and there was never time. And then finally I, I stopped with my Walkman in my hands and I said, wait a minute. Somehow life, real life, is getting in the way of collecting her life story. And I, there was there, something wrong with that picture, that I was following her around with one intent while she was doing something else. I mean, maybe I needed to shift into real life. But finally, and so here, here is a, um, it, it's a little bit long, but what she's telling me is she had, we had just sat down at one of the rare times, and she told me this, a, a really um, powerful story about how she lived with her grandmother. Her grandmother died. Her, um, her, her mother died. She got married. She had her first baby. The first baby died. And then she had Jamila, who is the baby she's holding here. And um, so let's see if we can, we can hear it. Anyway, she's, um, she's saying, Alhamdulillah, life is now good. We're settled. Um, I do my work every day. I wash clothes. I bring water. I bring wood. I take care of the baby. I take care of my husband. And there's no, there, there's no dausha. There's no noise or trouble. And as soon as she says dausha, that's when the baby starts going. Um, and so, so she's telling me. And so, you know, taking care of the baby and telling me life stories just wasn't working. But then one day... She said, tomorrow we can go out and we can collect wood and we can spend the whole day collecting stories. And so we, oh, this is a picture of me in the field drinking tea with Sabah. These pictures are raw. I haven't done anything to them. They've just been copied. And so there might be some things to bring out the background and others, but you're getting the raw material here. Oh, let's see if we can hear this one. This is the playful, this is another story. This is... Where women would wrestle with each other and attack each other all of a sudden and then make these animal noises. So, so play was another thing that uh, was getting in the way of me collecting my life story. So we took the donkey and uh, that's next to one of the um, scrap wood houses and uh, set off away from the community and out into a big open plain um, by the sea to collect wood and tell me the story. The Ina was very proud of her tape player, and um, that's a cassette tape player for you who are too young to know it. Um, and I traded her that tape player. She wanted a Nana Show Panasonic. 
That's what she wanted. So I got her on National Panasonic tape player, and we traded it for a very beautiful um, veil that that um, that she gave to me. And you see that she has made a beaded um, a beaded rope for it with beads all down the side, so that she could carry it with that beaded rope. And that's how she carried it. So as soon as we got away from the community and we, and we started to go out into the more open spaces, she pressed record on her back and she ululated, that was a ululation, oh, I can't do it, and, um, and, and, sang, and then sang at the top of her voice all the way to the place where we were going to collect wood. You'll probably be able to hear this. What she's singing is, Bokara Safari Yachabayib Iyomatodeya, which is, Tomorrow we travel, my loved ones. Today I bring you greetings. And then, and then the next verse is, Tomorrow we travel, searching for spring. So, um, let's see if we can hear it. She just sang at the top of her voice, and, and, um, and off we went. She collected the dead wood from the acacia tree um, to make fire and to, to make a pot of tea. And so these are images from um, while we're right at the scene. This picture some of you probably have seen. This is a photo I use in a lot of, um, a lot of different ways of the Aina up a tree. There's the researcher. <laughs> and um, you can see the tape player and you know it's around the fire and a pot of tea so the Aina took that picture from the tree. So she sat and she gave me the stories that I wanted, gave me stories about being young, gave me stories about going up into the mountains with the girls herding, gave me a stories about how she was brave one time, and a lot of different stories. But in between the stories, she gave me long, she, she um, had long poems. What, the first one that started, I am the Aina Farah Suleiman, and then it was a long, um, kind, almost an epic poem um, that's called a beda in, um, in Arabic. And then there were other poems that are either sung or they're, um, or they're spoken that are called hijani, which means little songs, and those are, are women's poems. So she was giving me these in between, and, and, and she was very interested, and then she was singing me songs. So in between each story came all of this poetry and all of these songs. And finally, we got done with our, um, our day, and I had two sides, it's over there, two sides of this tape that the Aina called Shiritna. Shirit is a cassette tape, and Shiritna is our tape, and so I had our tape. Now I knew that no matter what else happened, as long as I had this, I could get my master's thesis. I needed more, I needed more, but I knew that I was at the stage in my research where I could, I could make this do, and I could probably figure something out with it. So I was really, really happy. So we set off back for the, um, for the uh, community. And that evening, we sat with the women. And, um, and we were sitting with the women, and the Aina said to me, Fatma, go get Shiritna. Go get, go, go, go get our tape. And so I went back and I got the tape and I thought, oh good, now I can see how the women respond to the stories that she told me, yeah? And so I, I ran back and I got the tape and the women were interested and I put the tape in and I turned it on and she started telling stories and the women went, and they started talking with each other like they didn't even care about what was going on and they were talking, they, they, they were uninterested. But as soon as the story ended and the Ina started a poem, 
they were fixated on that tape machine. And they were looking at it and they were listening to it. And then when the next story came up, they said, can you, can you make it go through that one? Can you make it go through? Where's the next poem? Where's the next song? We're not, we're not, that, that, that's, that's stupid stuff. Why, why the stupid stuff? And so, um, so she went to the next poem and then they were, they were fascinated. And when she said a hajani, the women all stopped afterwards and listened, and then another woman said a hajani, and then another woman said a hajani. And so there was this communication going on through the poetry. And um, I have just, I don't know if you'll be able to hear this very well, but this is that evening some women singing. So, um, so it started a kind of song fest that evening with poetry and, and singing. The point of my story is, and just to end, um, end on this note, is that I went in without even realizing that I was looking for a life story, and I thought that the life story would look a certain way, would sound a certain um, way, and it would be a narrative, and um, she would tell me about her life, and I would learn that way about her life. What I learned was I got what I wanted, but it didn't look anything like what I thought it would look like. And that's how we learn in ethnography, is we get what we want, but it doesn't look anything like, usually, what we think it's supposed to look like. And so in that way, we learn not only about, um, not only about the culture that we're studying, but also reflexively about our own culture in comparison. And so I thank you very much for your time, and I, I welcome any questions. I've got a couple. Um, when you went in 1987 to get your masters, was that while they were still nomads, or were they were they already stopped um, they, in be, being a community? They had settled for about 12 years at that point. Okay, okay. And when she went up the tree to, to get the wood, I mean, they can't just pick it off the ground. I mean, that looks pretty dangerous. Um, there is wood on the ground that you can use. There's plants on the ground with dead wood that you can use. But they pick the, um, the dead wood from the acacia tree to use, so they're always climbing up trees to get wood. Okay, and, and in finding her story, you couldn't miss living with that family, finding children and men and their stories too, right? Exactly. Okay, I think it was amazing, and, and your description of your quest just reminds me so much of life. It never ends up being what you thought it was going to be. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right, and it's good to be open to that. Um, Deb, Simone de Beauvoir, who is a French feminist, um, described women as the other and described women's lives as being stuck in the banal, the mundane, the profane, because that's the household. And even Karl Marx uh, substantiated this view that the household, the home, is not the productive realm, it's the reproductive realm. Yet, having had conversations with you about the Bedouin women, you revealed that they have a tremendous amount of economic power given their role in the household. So the question I wanna ask you is, coming back to the United States, have you become more aware of Western masculinist assumptions about the home being uh, a pile of nothingness, uh, mon you know, the mundane, banal, nothing sacred about it? Uh, and it, did it change your views about your relationship with the home? I, I think it highlighted um, that in, Western Europe and the United States that with the Industrial Revolution we separated home from work, from productive um, income earning work and, and that it was the men who went out to work and at least the middle class women, poor women have always had to go out for work, but um, the middle class women who stayed at home, but production prior to the, um, to, to the Industrial um, Revolution 
was in the home so that women made their own clothes, women wove, women did um, productive work toward life from the home. And the Bedouin women still do productive life in, um, out of their homes. And in fact, I think that settling and becoming more urbanized is removing that productivity from them more and more, whereas when they were nomadic, they made their houses out of the um, wool from the sheep into tents, and they made the cheese, and they made most of the productive. Um, uh, so, so I think that uh, we feminists from the 1970s or from de Beauvier's time on have belittled the home because um, there's, there's less value in our society in that kind of work that gets done in the home. So does that answer your question? I, I enjoyed your comments on the uh, whole science of ethnography and reminded me of a quotation of a physicist who when he heard something totally outrageous would say that's not even wrong. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you went in with a certain cultural assumptions and then the process of learning. Can you talk about, you know, you were trying to get past life in an organized autobiography. What you were missing was life right in front of you. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about those moments of revelation when you just said, oh, that's the real story that's going on here and I've been seeing it in the wrong way. Hmm. Thanks, Gary. That I, I had planned this particular story and hadn't thought a lot about other, um, other examples. There might be people in the crowd who here who have um, been to the Sinai who could think of some ways that they uh, ran into their own assumptions. Hi, Kaylin. Hi, Ruth. Um, it would happen. It would happen all the time. You know, at the end, um, there was a there was a time where. I, I always wore the Bedouin dress and I always wore um, a, a scarf around my head and when I went out with the women I would wear the full veil because they want to be anonymous in public. They want people to see a Bedouin woman but they don't, they don't want people to know who that Bedouin woman is and that gives them more freedom of movement. Um, and so if I dressed, although they, everybody always know, knew who I was because I looked like a bag lady, you know, with, and my veils were always falling off me and stuff. But, but at any rate, I always, wore, I always wore the local dress and then I would go down to the beach and that's where the tourists were. So there were tourists in bikinis and tourists in, in, in um, speedos and, and, you know, and, and, and there's me and my, my scarf and my dress. And finally in the last three months I went and I started hanging out with the tourists more and finding out more about what, what they were about. And one woman said to me, you know, you hide in that Bedouin dress. You hide in that Bedouin dress. And, you should, you, sh you, sh you should try dressing like the rest of us and coming down to the beach and really being a, a visitor instead of a, a Bedouin woman. And I said, but I'm not a Bedouin woman. And they said, well, but you should. So one night I put my cotton trousers on and my t-shirt and in the evening I went down to the um, cafes. And the most amazing thing was that, and this was right at the end of my two years of, of um, my stay in, in 93, the most amazing thing was that all of the guys, all the Bedouin guys in the, sh in the cafes knew who I was and I would stop and visit with them on my way to Nueva to go to the post office and on my way back and in the last three months more and more sitting and hanging out with the guitar players and um, you know all of that on the beach. Um, it was quite a nice field work site by the way. Coral reefs and mountains and all of that. Um, and so I was amazed that evening because all of a sudden I became invisible to the Bedouin men who knew me. Hardly any of the men even recognized me in my t-shirt and my trousers. So all of a sudden, as now I was myself, how I would normally dress when at home, but I was invisible as just a tourist to the Bedouins who were looking at me. And then later that evening, I was, and, and I thought, they're, oh, they're going to think that, oh, yeah, now she's almost done, and now she's just going to shed her Bedouin dress and start acting like a, um, a, a hippie tourist. And, um, and yet, what the guys were saying to me, the Bedouin men were saying, you look beautiful tonight, Fatma. You look beautiful in your own clothing. And I said, you know, I was kind of afraid to do, and they said, well, when you're up with the women, then you wear Bedouin women clothing. But when you're down here, then you can dress like a tourist. So I was sitting with some other tourists in, um, in a cafe 
and a couple of Bedouin guys in my trousers and t-shirt, and a couple of Bedouin guys walked up, and I immediately did what Bedouins do, which is I didn't know them, and so I stood up to greet them. And I just did it automatically, because I was used to doing that now. And they looked shocked that this tourist would stand up and greet them like a Bedouin. And they said, you know, who are you? What, what's going on? And I realized that all along I had been an American woman on the inside, looking like a Bedouin woman on the outside. Now I was an American woman on the outside, feeling like a Bedouin woman on the inside. So it, it's, it's always that kind of play with, um, with, with contrasts and identity, really. Hi, Deb. I, like, I really like um, the images of your field subject. Um, I forget her name. Vaina. OK. And, um, and I, I forget how many times you've been back there. Oh, I, I don't know how many times, but every Cause couple cause, years. Because all of these images were from that first. All these images were from one roll of film, yeah, because on the very first roll of film I took. Because it just makes me wonder, like, you know, how, as time went on, you know, what did her life change? Was it the same? I mean, it's just, and I think that the veil, you know, creates a sense of mystery about who mm -hmm. is this person, and, you know, she sounds like a very interesting one. Yeah, very playful, very, and very young at the time. I think she was 16 or 17 in those pictures, newly married. Um, and that is one of the things that I realized I'm, I'm, I'm such a neophyte archivist because I have, I have a lot of photos that I didn't even get dealt with. I dealt with my fieldwork stuff on sabbatical, but I have a lot of other photos. And what I'm most interested in doing is, now that I have those early ones cataloged and I have the later pictures is to follow the trail of years through and look at things that change, both the community, um, which is now a, a, a regular town, and uh, women's dress, and what are the implications of those changes to, um, to their life now. Does that answer your question? Hi. Hi. I had two quick questions. Um, the first one was in terms of culture shock. Can you talk about like when you came back, is there anything you changed about your daily life or in general? Um, and then the second one kind of related, how do you stay in contact with the women? Do they have email access or? Um, I'll answer the first one or the second one first. I, um, I don't have a lot of contact with them when I'm not there. I have a friend from England, a colleague who goes quite regularly, so I'm able to send messages and they can send messages back through her. Sometimes I get a call from Germany saying, hi, hi, this is, um, you know, a, a guy from Germany and I, I met up with the Ina and Ayat and he, and they said to send you greetings. That happened after 9-11. I got two different calls from, one from Spain and one from Germany. Um, people hoping from the, who had just been visiting in the Sinai. Um, they're always giving me email addresses that don't work, and, they're, and they've all got cell phones now. Everybody has a cell phone. And so, um, but the cell phones don't necessarily go overseas. So when I show up, I show up. And um, you asked about culture shock, and in particular you were asking about reverse culture shock. So what happens when, and, and Clifford Geertz um, has a nice quote about that. Um, in terms of writing up field work, once you've completely assimilated yourself into a community, then you have to come home and then you have to address again the world of blackboards and chalk and professors and seminars. And he says, what happens to culture when it gets shipped abroad? And so um, that's an, an, another aspect of it. But um, in terms of reverse culture shock, I experienced it a lot. I experienced living inside instead of being mostly outside. I, I, I experienced missing knowing just automatically what phase of the moon it was because I, I could tell by the phase of the moon whether I'd be able to walk easily at night. If it was a full moon, I could almost read by it, but otherwise I had to bring a flashlight. I missed the way that I slept, um, which was kind of in an envelope of, of sheet and blanket, kind of swaddled around me instead of in a bed. Um, I missed, and, but the thing that people noticed the most was how body I was when I got back because the Bedouin women are very body and they're always telling penis and vagina jokes, you know, and stories, stories, stories. And so, and so I, re and, and I would just come up with these stories and then look around and see all these shocked people and my sister going, 
like that. And so, um, and so I wasn't in Sinai anymore, you know. And then I'd say, oh, but it's okay, it's okay, the women do it. Well, we don't do that here. Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much. Feel free to look around.